So uh, Merrily said we're going to start uh, quite high level. Nor normally, I, I do things that are so high level, all the content has evaporated. So um, uh, this is sort of uh, along the lines of a gluten-free presentation. It's a sort of content-free presentation. And it's, it's meant uh, really as uh, an hors d'oeuvre. Um, it's, uh, it's an appetizer. Uh, for what comes later. It's a little bit of context, so I'm, I'm, I'm rather like the, the waiter that touches your elbow asking, do you want shrimp or, 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 or some um, um, pastry uh, confection with garish colors on top. So uh, um, that's, uh, that's me uh, uh, in, a, in a black shirt there. So I'm, I'm going to say a few words about the, uh, the library context, the library environment, which sets up, I hope, uh, a little bit um, the uh, context uh, for why uh, we feel this is especially interesting, and also uh, which sets up, I hope, uh, some of the more content uh, full uh, uh, presentations that will follow. Uh, so the library in the uh, life of uh, the user. Um, so uh, just to, to set things up, libraries clearly are not uh, ends in themselves. They serve the uh, research and learning needs of the institution of which they're a part. Uh, for people here, that's they serve the research and le learning needs of the, of the university or, or college of which they're a part. And I think uh, the major long-term uh, influence on libraries is how those needs change, how those universities change, how learning and research behaviors change, how people who use libraries want to use libraries, how people who support libraries want those libraries to behave within those institutions. Now, the mechanisms for that influence may be tenuous or diffuse, but in the long term, the, the library needs to support the institution of which it's a part. And to be effective, libraries need to understand and respond uh, to those uh, changes. And I think um, if we think uh, over uh, the last few years, we've seen a big uh, growth of interest in ethnographic, anthropological, uh, design-centered uh, approaches to thinking about the library. And this is because uh, the university, the college, uh, the uh, learner, the researcher, people's behaviors are changing in, in a variety of ways. Uh, and we don't always understand the ways those are changing. People want to do things differently. They are doing things differently. So as a symptom of, of those changes, we've seen really uh, quite a strong uh, uh, growth in uh, investigations of uh, changing behavior, investigation of behavior, um, uh, investigations of uh, what people are doing. Pioneering uh, was the work uh, of uh, Susan Gibbons and her colleagues in um, uh, Rochester. Uh, there was, uh, here in Illinois, uh, a large set of interrelated activities around the Ariel Project, and the uh, leader of that work <coughs> is here today. We'll talk later. Uh, the last picture there is the sort of logo, the sign for a series of activities around user experience that um, uh, some uh, colleagues in Cambridge uh, have been looking at, have been leading, looking at ethnographic approaches, looking at the ways in which uh, people are changing. So in a changing world, it's natural that people want to find out about, think about how uh, things are changing. This is uh, a review of some of that um, uh, literature, a survey of the use of ethnographic methods in the study of libraries and library users. And I read this um, uh, a couple of years ago when I was trying to uh, uh, go through uh, a range of, of, of this uh, literature. And I was struck uh, by the way in, in which this was put. There's a growing interest in qualitative analyses of the social lives of the libraries and the roles that libraries play in the lives of their users. So that, that phrase, the uh, role that libraries play in the lives of their users, sort of struck a, a um, chord. Now, clearly, this is presented still in, in very library terms and in uh, technology terms. Uh, at the same time, or, or slightly later, I was working with uh, Barbara Pfister on a um, ACRL 75th anniversary uh, volume uh, looking at uh, directions. And uh, she wrote at that time, uh, thanks to the many ethno ethnographic researchers who've enriched our understanding of the library and the life of the user rather than the other way around, 
who have pioneered new ways to peer into those lives while keeping it ethical. Um, so again, uh, sort of thinking about uh, the library and the, and the life of the user. And so thinking about this, I uh, was thinking that a, an interesting way of characterizing the change that we've seen over the last few years is that very much our traditional model of the library, or the library then at some time, was uh, one in which we thought of the user in the life of the library. So if you listen to uh, some discussions, some people talking, you know, they'll talk about my collections, my library, my services, and people come to my collections, my library, my, my services. If you listen to some other people talking, they'll talk about uh, uh, the research life of the institution, they'll talk about the ways in which uh, that's changing, they'll talk about how they are engaging with the institution. And it seemed to me in the last few years we'd seen a shift in terms of the focus of uh, library attention increasingly moving away from thinking about uh, the uh, library as this uh, managed uh, building collection systems, which we, we have to do, to thinking about the library as something that supported research in particular ways and had to res support research in these uh, new or, or different ways or supported learning in particular ways and had to support learning in, in these uh, new ways. So increasingly we think about the library in the lives of our users partly because those users' lives are changing in a variety of ways. So I was feeling very pleased with myself about this formulation and, and was uh, you know, sending out emails to colleagues about how clever it was. And uh, two of those colleagues, both of them in the room, uh, independently sent me back this uh, quote um, uh, where, uh, in effect, uh, so this is from a, a PhD in 1973, um, in effect, they have looked at the user and the life of the library rather than the library and the life of the user. So as you can understand, this was uh, hugely deflating. Uh, you know, when, I, when I got the first email, I was very deflated. When I got the second one, I thought, well, you know, um, they were ganging up on me. But the, um, the uh, now, this is you know slightly different context, but nevertheless, it was interesting interesting to see the uh, the formulation there. So, um, what we have been doing within uh, OCLC research, um, uh, um, Lynn Conaway and her colleagues, working in collaboration with a variety of other people, we have been trying to understand more about uh, the library in uh, the life of the user. Uh, how to engage with people where they uh, live and learn. Uh, this report uh, pulls together uh, some of that work. Some of you uh, got copies uh, outside. And then there's a range of other work which pulls this together. So we've been very interested to try and understand how uh, potential users of libraries are doing things in this new environment so that the library can be active in their lives, so that the library can be an active partner in the research and learning behaviors uh, which they now uh, practice, so that the library can think about how to support what they do in useful and uh, interesting ways. So uh, that's uh, some broad context. Stepping back a little bit, um, um, just to look at, at some uh, wider uh, context, if you think about education, clearly those of you who track uh, developments in education will see that in higher education especially there's huge discussion and debate about education futures, um, many, many, many uh, books and um, um, other uh, interventions uh, appearing, a lo lot of discussion about education uh, futures. This is uh, the homepage from Indiana Wesleyan University, uh, which uh, um, I find uh, quite, quite, quite interesting, um, largely because um, I live in Columbus, the orbital road Columbus is 270, and Indiana Wesleyan University has a building on 270, um, which is uh, geared towards basically career convenience, you know, adult uh, learners, professional. Uh, professional um, uh, courses. But if you look at uh, the home page, it's really quite interesting. They're very clear what they do. Um, so they have a residential undergraduate uh, college. So they have a Christ-centered community in Marion, Indiana. So they have a values-based residential liberal arts college. And then they have 
a set of adult and graduate courses, which they offer through a variety of satellites in the, in the Midwest. And then they have a variety of online uh, programs. So what they've done over the last few years is they have redesigned a future for themselves in this complex educational environment that um, complements their uh, residential values-based um, um, experience with these two other very different experience aimed at different um, constituencies. So if you think about higher education um, generally, uh, many of the people in the room clearly are from uh, research libraries, um, um, which have a, a clear view, purpose, uh, mission of uh, um, how they fit into the world where they are, and they're trying to uh, reinforce and build on that. We have a variety of other institutions that are very focused on career and convenience. And then we have a range of institutions that are really thinking about um, where their, their future is. And I think what we're seeing, uh, and we'll see more of over the next few years, is a, a much clearer focus on the particularities of particular types of institution in the way that, say, Indiana Wesleyan did, where institutions need a, a clear uh, identity. It's quite interesting seeing uh, various uh, land-grant universities um, emphasize recently um, that, that background. Um, but a, an emergence of a clearer uh, view of the university and where it sits in um, the uh, broader range. Some people will more clearly focus on career and convenience. We'll have people focusing on research. Those people in the middle will have to figure out what is their role, what is their, what is their niche. And you will all have seen the, the various dire prognostications about institutions disappearing and so on. What this means is that increasingly uh, institutions are shifting from a, a bureaucratic mindset to an enterprise one. Bureaucratic, not a judgment, but saying that in a bureaucracy, the ends are given. You know what the ends are, and what you do is you organize your resources to achieve those ends. Every, everybody understands what the organization is about. In an enterprise, you have certain resources, and you have to decide how to organize those to achieve particular ends. So what Indiana Wesleyan has done is it has decided that it has different ends than just being a residential uh, liberal arts college, and it has reorganized itself to meet those ends. Um, so institutions beginning to think about how to position themselves, how to reposition themselves. From a library point of view, I think this is really quite a big thing. From a research library point of view, quite a big thing, as we'll say later, because libraries beginning to think about what do I do with research data? What do I do to support digital scholarship? What do I do to support a variety of things that may need to uh, reshape, to reconfigure, um, uh, to reallocate? And then obviously, big influence uh, of uh, various impact measures, but thinking about measuring and then responding based on those measures. So we have a big interest in analytics and assessment internally, but then also externally, uh, major focus uh, thinking about ranking, reputation, profiling. So uh, these things are, are, are circular and uh, enforce uh, each other. The sort of uh, poster child for uh, having uh, moved uh, quite far in a particular direction, obviously Arizona State University, thinking about the sort of new model, the new uh, American University. Um, and the uh, president of Arizona State, clearly very clear view of uh, where that uh, is. So a focus on um, a large uh, public university trying to increase at the same time inclusivity, inclusion, to be um, a, an a economic, social, inclusive engine for uh, the people uh, of uh, uh, Arizona and beyond, but at the same time trying to increase uh, excellence in research, excellence in teaching. So uh, a view may have been that those two things was difficult to do those two things at the same time. They are saying we can do those two things at the same time and are saying how they're going to do it. But the reason this is interesting is this is a slide from um, the um, uh, a presentation about direction. Basically, they're saying we have to redesign ourselves to do this. We have to become an enterprise. We have to decide how we are going to do this. It's not business as usual. We, this involves a design process, a redesign uh, process. 
Um, uh, so very much shifting from being a university which does all these university things to um, a university that says we want to do these things, how do we get there? So uh, much more um, uh, purposeful in that way. And the reason for uh, saying that is I think this um, Arizona State now wants an Arizona State style library, whatever that means. Um, uh, some years ago, the University of Manchester merged with the University of Manchester Institute of Science and Technology and said, we are going to become a top 20 university in the world. The librarian was told, you know, we want a top 20 library in the world. Um, but over time, increasingly, the, you know, the library needs to fit into um, uh, the university and increasingly thinking about that enterprising view that, you know, how do you move in a, in a particular direction? From a technology point of view, all these behaviors sort of co-evolving with uh, technology environments. We've moved away from the view that technology is something out there that influences us. We inhabit a techni technological environment. It's part of the fabric of uh, research and learning, part of the fabric of what we do. So we're seeing uh, research and learning workflows changing in that environment. We've seen very much uh, emerging a sense, and you know, this will be discussed uh, 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 quite a bit later, you know, the em emergence of the network and um, the personal. We all have um, a, uh, a visibility in the network, maybe small, maybe large. But in our um, working personal lives, uh, we interact with large network presences. We interact with Google, we interact with Facebook, we interact with Amazon, and then we have very personal things as well. And uh, this sort of concentration, big network presences and diffusion, you know, we have mobile devices, we have um, um, things on our desk and so on, means that quite often the middle gets squeezed. And this plays into, um, you know, what is the role of the institution? So if we think about, uh, things that are happening in a research context. We have these emerging network services, you know, research networks, uh, archive, you know, I'll say a little bit about them in a minute. Um, and we have uh, individuals doing things and lots of questions about what is the institutional uh, role. Research data is, uh, is a good example. Uh, for big data, very big data, the people who do that work um, quite often um, um, know what to do with it, how to do with it. Small to medium data, you know, there, there's an issue there. And is this a personal responsibility, institutional responsibility? Does it happen in the discipline? Does it happen in some national services in particular places? So lots of uh, interesting uh, attention there at the moment. And then we have this shift from consumption towards creation, uh, from taking to uh, making. Um, so, Network environment is changing uh, all around us in various ways. A good example of the network and the personal is uh, Google Scholar, which we know is really uh, very uh, uh, pervasive of, of behaviors. And one of the interesting things about Google Scholar is it's, it's got the concentration, it's got the network presence, it's got gravitational attraction, but then it's also quite personal in that it will send me alerts, it will tell me who's citing my work, it will give me recommendations. So it's, it's got that combination of the the network and the personal concentration and diffusion and um, 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 the middle gets squeezed. Various people who have seen this picture produced in the, uh, by um, uh, people working in the library in Utrecht in the uh, Netherlands, just trying to look at the range of workflow support tools that um, scholars are using uh, in a variety of uh, contexts. I just put it up again to illustrate the, the diversity of this network environment, the variety of ways in which people are doing things in a network environment. <clears throat> okay. So uh, against that background, I um, wanted just to say something very quickly about um, emphases. So um, uh, John Hagel, some of you may know, a collaborator of uh, John Seeley Brown, um, a few years ago produced um, uh, this model. He said, you know, organizations historically had three major focus, firms, companies. Um, 
customer relationship management, product innovation, and infrastructure. And they require different skills, different orientations. Customer relationship management, you attract, you build relationships, it's service-oriented, economies of scope are important. Um, you want to know lots of things about lots of people. Infrastructure, back office, has to be heavy, reliable, economies of scale are uh, important. Product innovation, you want to be nimble, quick, um, develop new products and services, and speed and flexibility are important. So the characteristics needed to do that is sort of different than those and different from these. And what they say is, if you look at what's happened in, in sort of general environment, what tends to happen is these things are splitting apart. So Apple, um, Apple outsources much of its infrastructure, much of its building. It's very focused on product innovation, and it does some customer relationship management. Newspapers have outsourced their infrastructure because they're really in the customer relationship management business. What they do is they assemble ad, uh, people, and they assemble advertisers, and they put the two together. If you think about, ah, <laughs> it occurred to me that I only use a fraction of what PowerPoint can do for me. <laughs> I mean, who knew, huh? <laughs> I, I discovered that this morning. Um, I, I'm going to have any presentation I do will have its origami uh, feature there. So. Um, Customer relationship management, the wrong word maybe in a, in a library context, but the library does engagement. It, it provides study spaces, social spaces. It interprets needs and aligns uh, services behind those needs. It reaches out with uh, consultancy support services. Uh, you know, it does marketing. It sort of customizes, personalizes. So it really focuses on trying to understand the community it serves and provide services that meet those needs. It also, historically, though, has provided infrastructure. And in fact, if you look at what libraries have done historically, much of their time has gone on managing infrastructure, uh, buildings, collections, systems, um, the, the stuff that the uh, library manages. And then it's tried to acquire and develop new resources, services to support uh, research learning workflows to innovate in various ways. So. Um, Going back to what I was saying earlier about the a focus on infrastructure uh, is something that, that has been prevalent in the past in, in a library context. And that leads to that very much the user in the life of the library. You know, the user in my building, the user in my collections. Customer relationship management or engagement is thinking about how do I, how do I meet the needs of my users? How do I put the library in the, in the um, life of the user? So if you think about libraries generally against this background, I would say that a lot of what we can see at the moment uh, is involved in shifting a little bit uh, and realigning these three things. So what we're seeing is a big shift to engagement, a big shift to, in those terms, customer relationship management, a big shift to saying, how do we understand the research and learning behaviors of our institution? How do we support them? How do we meet new needs? From an innovation point of view, um, clearly, that involves innovating around services, but there's also uh, a lot of institutional innovation going on. How do I redesign what I'm doing? Um, what new services do I need? But also, what collaborations do I need? How do I do things in a more groupy uh, sort of way? And then uh, infrastructure, there's a discussion really going on about right scaling infrastructure. People are moving things to the cloud. People are moving collections into shared print environments. You know how. Uh, every library shouldn't do everything. So a lot of focus on thinking about what is the context uh, in which uh, I do things. And Hattie Trust, for example, is quite interesting. 20, 30 years ago, each library would have tried to do that on its own. Now people recognize that it should be done together. So the reason, though, for um, uh, talking about this, though, is really from a library point of view, we've had a lot of attention to infrastructure. And in this current environment of change, recognizing that we have to shift resources to thinking about engagement with research and learning and not doing so much uh, managing uh, infrastructure. So I thought I'd run through uh, one example, um, thinking about collections and space, given that these are core to library identity and um, uh, purpose. So if you think about um, collections, uh, 
I'm going to touch very quickly on, on these ways in which library collections and our views of them and attitudes to them are changing. And I think the reason for doing this is collections were very much core to what the library had. The library built collections and made them available to users. What we're seeing is a move towards thinking about how do I support research and learning behaviors in various ways through the use of content, collections, and materials. So um, if you think about a shift um, um, then, we had a collection that the library owned, and it was visible in the catalog. We moved to adding a licensed collection that was visible in a discovery system. I mean, obviously, we had a history there of meta search and so on. But anyway, uh, so we have catalog. Now we have knowledge base. We have discovery. Then um, we added a variety of things that were available, but not necessarily owned or licensed. You know, one place where those are made visible is libguides, a variety of other things. We point to things that people are interested in, even if we don't own or, or license them. But then from a user point of view, the user now has access to a global resource, which is visible through Google, ResearchGate, Mendeley, a variety of things. So we've moved from a situation where the user had access to the collection that the library owned in a physical world and had to go to the library, to a situation where the user has access to a global resource. Um, and this really is because discovery has been separated from uh, the collection. The user now has discovery in a global um, collection. And what this means, I think, is that we're seeing, um, especially for research libraries, the managed owned collection remains very important for, for a, a variety of reasons. But it's complemented by thinking about how do I provide access to a facilitated collection? How do I provide access to a range of materials that may be of interest? Focus also shifts to other services. How do I support creation? How do I um, support uh, research data? How do I do things? And um, more thinking about system-wide thinking, especially in relation to how you manage the owned collection. So another way of looking at that is that we've moved from an owned collection, which you had purchased and physically stored, and it was here, and people came to it to a place now where we have a facilitated collection. And examples are you point people at Google Scholar, include freely available books in the catalog, e-books, uh, create resource guides. And along the way, there are a variety of things. The borrowed collection, so there's a collection available through resource sharing. There's a collection available through licensing. Uh, we've moved in a big way towards demand-driven uh, materials, which may end up as owned, but provides a, a different way of looking at things. And we're moving towards a situation where we potentially have a shared uh, print collection. So the, the idea, which is sort of still in, in our minds somewhere, the owned collection has um, changed actually quite a bit. At the same time, if you think about the uh, uh, researcher, learner workflow, um, you know, the workflow has become, as it were, an important content supply chain. Um, materials flow through these workflows, and people are interested in these things. So if you just think about a variety of things, you have disciplinary repositories, you have discovery services, you have research networks, social discovery, um, uh, uh, Wikipedia, Yahoo Answers, Khan Academy, you know, you know, a whole range of resources that are available that, that are part of um, uh, workflow. This is a picture from the Utrecht study earlier, just blown up. And it shows you know, a range of services that people use in a, in a variety of ways. This is a picture from uh, Elsevier, which is quite similar. Um, and the, the point here isn't you know, what the services are necessarily. It's that uh, these are services that are available. Some of these will just go away. Some of them will become very important. Some of them will become very important and then go away. Um, so it's, it's uh, you know, a whole uh, range of things. But the, the point is that the network is rich in these types of opportunity. I thought this was uh, qu quite interesting. Uh, this is Annette Thomas, uh, who was CEO of Macmillan Publishers, um, talking about um, the uh, role of the publisher. So the publisher is here to make the scientific research process more effective, just like libraries. By help, helping them to keep up to date, find colleagues, plan experiments, and then share their results, uh, just like libraries. 
After they've published, uh, the process continues uh, with gaining a reputation, obtaining funds, finding collaborators, and even finding a new job. What can we as publishers do to address some of scientists' pain points, just like um, libraries? So if you think about this, what, what's happening is that publishers are beginning to think about that whole workflow and provide workflow products. And if you go back um, to this picture, one of the things that's down here is uh, digital science, um, which is, um, uh, well, was until recently part of um, Macmillan. The um, changes have happened in, in ownership there, but it's still part of Holtzbrink. So you've got a range of digital science services. You've got, um, if you think about Elsevier, there's a range of uh, Elsevier services, but you're seeing ranges of services emerge that help manage research workflow, manage content, and if you like, become a supply chain for, for, uh, for content. At the same time, you know, you look at Elsevier pulling things together, you look at the Springer Nature merger, um, you know, publishers are trying to develop the scale that they can actually provide a full range of uh, workflow services. The Elsevier's acquisition of Pure and Mendeley, quite interesting with a back end and a front end to add to uh, publishing. And as we know, um, uh, uh, various faculty very interested in profiles, collecting stuff, and I mean, actually quite difficult to maintain these uh, in a big way. That, I, don't, I, that, I thought that was quite nice as well, but uh, I spent about half an hour looking at them all. Um, those are the only two I, I use, though. Um, that's clever, yeah. It's, I think it's quite clever the way they work backwards as well as forwards. Um, um, so um, this is uh, through, uh, this is looking in a crystal ball, you see. Um, the, um, so workflows, new content. In the print world, researchers and learners organize their workflow around the library. In a digital world, the library increasingly needs to organize itself around the workflows of researchers and learners. In the print world, the library had limited interaction with the full workflow process. In the digital world, increasingly workflows generate and consume information resources, and the library potentially interacts with the full workflow. Um, so that leads into thinking about creation. So this is uh, from some work that uh, our colleagues have done, looking at the scholarly record. But the reason for drawing attention to it is to show uh, you know, what's happened. Historically, the library was interested in the outcomes. It collected journals, it collected um, books. These effectively are the exhibition, the final product, the outcome of the research. They're, they're, they're the, um, they memorialize the research. What we're seeing over the last few years increasingly is that some of the process of research, not just the product or the outcome or the uh, exhibition as it were, but the process, you know, the methods, the evidence, uh, especially in the form of research data, and the discussion, you know, you have preprints, you have a, a range of other activity, and to some extent the aftermath of research, what happens, you know, reusing and so on, have also become interested. And the library potentially has to interact with this full range. So from a reuse point of view, you know, big interest in copyright. Uh, up here, big interest in research data. So from a position where uh, the library collected the outputs, the outcomes, the books and journals, and then people interacted with them, now we have the whole, not just the products of research, the outcomes, but the whole process is not being managed by the library, but there are services that can be provided there, and there is a demand for services. And if you think about what's happening more generally in the network, you know, you, you see a, a range of things. Figshare is quite interesting, a digital science company initially aimed at individual researchers, but now sort of focused on institutions, you know, because institutions uh, pay, uh, whereas uh, individuals uh, don't. But a uh, range of services here looking at that workflow. And uh, as we're local, a, uh, uh, institutions beginning to think about how do we support uh, creation, research data, the range of ways in which people are conducting uh, workflow and process. Finally, uh, thinking about space and print, uh, people want to reconfigure space so that it's configured around user experiences and not configured around print. Historically, library space was largely configured around print. 
people now want to configure library space around user experiences. And um, you know, there's a lot of work here. What this means as well, it connects with the print collection in that it um, makes us think about the print collection in different ways. Uh, big focus on managing down print, big focus on shared print. This is a picture from um, uh, Technology uh, U um, University in Sydney, Mal Booth. And the, they asked students what they wanted to see in their new space. So they're building a new space, and the new space is going hand in hand with building a uh, retrieve, automated retrieval system um, to manage uh, much of the collections. I, I quite liked um, atriums and curves. Um, I think you should only work in places with atriums and curves. Um, but it was, it was quite interesting what they came up with. But you know, the focus here clearly is it's on experience. It's on uh, having a, a place to work, a place to meet, a place to, a place to do things. This is a picture I quite like from some work we did on um, characterizing the print collection of North America. And what it does is it shows how much of the aggregate print collection in libraries of all types is in these areas. And these areas are Richard Florida's mega regions, so it doesn't matter. I think the interesting thing about this picture, it shows that the print resource is actually something finite and manageable, and, and it makes it real in some way. Um, but we certainly, we've seen this parallel focus on space and the, the print collection. So from a collection point of view, if you think about the user, the library and the life of the reader, the creator, the learner, um, moving to say, not just a just-in-time collection, but you know, what types of things do users want? How do we support users who are managing, characterizing, describing, sharing uh, their own content and other people's? How do we support digital scholarship? How do we support research data management? Um, how do we begin to think about managing that bubble of print um, so that we can reconfigure our spaces around user experiences and how do we manage print uh, over time in that context. So if you think about, um, and you know, that was a sort of excursion into print just to say that a whole range of things are happening and they sort of are aligned around this view that increasingly you want the library to be active in the life of the reader. You don't just want the reader to come into the library to see the owned um, collection. And I know that nobody thinks that, but it's interesting to see the, to see the spread. So um, if you think about you know, the uh, activities, you know, you know, collections, expertise, systems, space, um, uh, we're seeing um, you know, all of them have, have been changing uh, over time to uh, move from this situation where it was the user in the life of the library to thinking about the library and the life of the user. So from an expertise point of view, moving to being a partner in research and learning, a partner in creation, an advisor, a consultant. Uh, from a collections point of view, moving from just in time to facilitated from a systems point of view, the back office remains important, but thinking about you know, interaction with workflow, support for digital scholarship, thinking about shared systems, and then space moving from being configured around collections to being configured around user experiences. So you know, we have a general, uh, general um, shift in that way. I began with, with this picture, which is a public library. It's a new public library in Columbus, uh, Ohio, and it's in uh, quite a, a depressed area. Uh, it's uh, just won a prize. And it's, you know, it's quite, quite, quite interesting. It's got space in it for um, the uh, Columbus Community College uh, meeting rooms, drastically reduced print footprint, large uh, number of computers. But in talking about uh, this and other things with Pat Lezinski, who is the uh, librarian of Columbus Metropolitan Library, he came, he came up with this, uh, what I thought was a very striking um, statement. He said, 20 years ago I was in the libraries business, um, but today I'm in the Columbus business. So if you think about what he, mean, what he means is that, from his point of view, Columbus Metropolitan Library has to be active in the life of the city, has to be a partner in uh, education, in uh, helping people through high school, in doing a variety of things. Um, 
I just thought it was an interesting formulation. So if you asked a university librarian, you know, 20 years ago I was in the libraries business, today I'm in the student business, I'm in the research and learning business, I'm in the scholarship business, I'm in the what business. It was very clear though, uh, his perspective was, I am in the business of making Columbus a better place to live, I'm in the business of making Columbus successful. And uh, I think putting the library in the life of the user is, I am in the business of making my institution uh, more effective, my uh, students more effective, my faculty more effective. So uh, just to conclude, uh, libraries are not ends in themselves. They serve the research and learning needs. Major long-term influence is how those needs change. To be effective, libraries need to understand and respond to those changes. So in terms of the uh, presentations um, uh, that we uh, are going to see, the discussion we're going to have, it's really thinking about how libraries understand and respond uh, to uh, the changes uh, in, in, in the environment in a more contentful way. Thank you.